So those of you who are interested in uh, cloud computing, you probably know that most of it runs on Linux. Well, the next guy we're talking to, Alex Polvey, is uh, uh, bringing us a new version of Linux that he's built for the uh, infrastructure crowd. And we're going to talk about why we need a new version of Linux right now with Core OS. Who are you? Uh, hi, I'm Alex Polvey. CEO of CoreOS. Uh, more importantly, though, I'm a sysadmin at heart. I was uh, previously with Rackspace, uh, which I joined through the acquisition of my previous company, CloudKick. And then CloudKick provided cloud server and monitoring management tools. Very cool. It's nice to be uh, back here in the office. Um, I, you know, this formerly was my office. Uh, we, you know, started this office and grew up, and I joined through the acquisition of my previous company, CloudKick, uh, okay. which provided cloud server monitoring and management tools. So I've been hearing a lot about your new company uh, from pe people who care about infrastructure. Well, first of all, what is Core OS and why? Yeah, what is Core OS? <laughs> what is the thing you're building? <laughs> sure, uh, Core OS is a new Linux-based operating system. Um, you know, you could call it a Linux distribution if you want, but people don't really call like, Android a Linux distribution. For instance, it's a, kind of a different way of thinking about running server infrastructure. And we just think that you know, times have changed quite a bit with how people run servers, and it's time to do something quite a bit different than what we've seen before. And so it's not a derivative of like Debian or Ubuntu or Red Hat. It's its own whole new thing. It is based on Linux, um, and it incorporates a lot of concepts that you know, are rooted in like uh, what folks like Google or Facebook do for running their server infrastructure. But you know, for, we're building it for companies that aren't Google or Facebook that, that don't have all the engineers to build it themselves. Yeah, uh, I once met a guy who just wrote uh, uh, hard drive di drivers for Google, right. which shows what lengths they went to to build a custom version of Linux for Google to make it faster to pull data off and on and put data onto hard drives. We don't use hard drives too much anymore. We're starting to switch into totally flash-based data centers. Right? right, right. So does that, so tell me uh, what's your approach to uh, building infrastructure that's different than the guy who used to work at Google building that stuff? Sure. I think if you take a, a, a group of architects that you know, are building out server infrastructure, and given the current state of technology and tools and capabilities, if you ask them what, you know, how, what's the right way to do X, Y, and Z, different groups of people uh, will roughly come to the same solution over and over again. Um, it's like there's only so many ways to make a pancake, if you will. So yeah. maybe five years ago it was, um, you know, with, with these spinning disks, you need to like how you write data to them. There's certain ways that you would handle that. And given the current state of things, you know, there are a set of best practices for how you go and do things. And for most companies, those best practices are all theoretical. And for us, we take those theoretical best practices and actually productize them. And we give you tools to allow you to do that. That's things like fault tolerance, like you can remove any machine out of, out of a group of servers and your applications keep running. What, what ops guy wouldn't want that, right? Yeah. But yet, if you ask an operations team, can we do that with your infrastructure? Can we just go pull the plug on a random server and things keep working? They'll be like, no, 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 no. And so, you know, those sorts of things, we like take the theoretical and make it actually possible for people. So uh, let's cover the business. How, how do I buy this? How do I deploy, you know, let's say, it, uh, I'm a customer of Rackspace Cloud or Amazon Cloud. Can I use this? What, sure. How do I get CoreOS? Sure. So like, like most... <laughs> it's not an app on my iPhone. <laughs> right. Like most Linux OSs, there's a big open source component to it. So you can go on Rackspace, you can go on many different cloud providers and boot CoreOS uh, and launch it there. And that's all, all for free. And it allows you to participate in the open source community and you know, get help just like a normal distribution. On the commercial side, we have products which make it really feel much more like a software as a service in a way. So you know like when you log into Gmail, you always log into the latest version of Gmail, yeah. right? Why, are, why isn't your server that way? Why when you log in your server, isn't it just always like managed and up to date for you by, by the software vendor that's distributing it? So on the business model side, we offer those capabilities where we just automatically keep the server up to date and sort of with the latest security and stability and performance patches and everything. And then you have support on that as well. Just like when you go into a SaaS application, you click help me with something, you'll get you know, a Zendesk with somebody to help you like, uh, figure out the issue. And so companies can pay for that commercial level support. 
uh, as well as access to you know, additional tools and control panels built on top of CoreOS. But the base OS itself and all the technology is open source, Apache 2.0 license, and people are using it all over the place. Give me a, uh, three things that people uh, will notice are really different about CoreOS. Sure. So. Uh, one is containers. Containers is something we've been talking a lot about. Uh, containers is is a design requirement of CoreOS. So the way that the way that we, we just interviewed uh, Docker, so there's a Docker video out on our channel. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. So Docker still requires Linux and an OS somewhere. It's a really nice way to package your applications and run it, but you still have to run it on Linux somewhere at the end of the day, right? Yeah. So CoreOS is that perfect base host for running your container. Now, can you run containers on different Linux OSs? Sure, but our our the way we built everything is specifically around containers, sort of from the start. It's just like built for that model of. So it's easier to maintain. Yeah, I mean, if you boot CoreOS, Docker just works. For instance, you don't need to like set up your kernel drivers and installing packages or anything. It's just all there and ready to go. And and that that allows us to package your applications as these as these, you know, things that you can just go and deploy arbitrarily across your server. So containers are sort of the first one, like the the. Kind of first way that an end user can package something, and having a container in there is really nice because a user has like they're not coding to a specific CoreOS thing for their application, right? They're can, right. they're they're bundling their application in a roughly you know neutral format, um, and then it can be you know moved around. But we think you'll get the best experience if you run it on CoreOS because it's designed to run containers. Number two. Number two updates. That's what I think is the most interesting thing personally is the way we actually patch and manage the OS. So. So, for instance, when you How's take it different than Linux. Sure. So right. the way it's done today, <laughs> yeah. So the way what happens today? Let's say you have, um, let's say you have the you know some kernel vulnerability comes out that people can get privileges uh, on on a server. Okay, if it's bad enough. What happens is all the IT teams around the world scramble and start to go and patch and update their servers. Okay, and. There's a subset that don't even know that there's a problem, and those servers don't get touched at all. And maybe those servers are just forgotten about. Maybe the guy moved on from his job, and just nobody's paying attention for them. Okay, yeah. and and we believe because the way that like software updates and patches are done today, that there will just be machines that are out there forever, compromisable. Um, and so our approach to this is we push the patch and we apply it to you. And we sort of borrowed this concept from what we saw happen in the browsers a while ago. Do you remember when Internet Explorer was like the bane of everybody's existence? Oh, yeah. It was constantly getting still is, compromised. I mean, <laughs> it still 40, is. 40 something percent or some yeah, large but, percentage. But there was a phase when it was getting compromised and it was a mess and there was no alternatives and it was just like very it dark still times is. on we the just, web. We've just protected everybody else from <laughs> Exactly, <mess>. exactly. <laughs> and so, but that, that allowed Firefox to come about. I was working at Mozilla at the time um, when, when that kind of whole thing happened. And then Chrome came out and really trumped everybody. And what Chrome did differently is it just automatically patched and apply, applied those patches to the browser. And when you restart it, you're just running the latest version. Yeah. And I believe because of that little change, just that they applied the patch, not just make it available, that was the biggest step function of web security that like, the world has seen to date on the internet. And we also got things like HTML5 out of the deal, too, because they could just distribute and update and like, upgrade the web overnight. On servers, we have nothing like this. On servers, state of the art is get it running and don't touch it. Yeah. So if if we can we if we could take this concept, which is a pretty radical departure from what people do today, we think we can fundamentally improve the security, but also get performance, reliability, and feature richness just by patching software. Why why are people resistant to this? I, you know, my co-author Shell still refuses to automatically update his apps on his iPhone. Right. Much less servers. Servers are full of uh, the world's most private information. Exactly, exactly. Why, why, are, why, are, why is the world so resistant? To this? We believe it's just because of the way that software is like bundled and deployed on servers makes it so painful and fragile that people are just resistant to changing anything. It's really the fragile, like how fragile things are uh, when they run. And so we've, we've re-architected, one, how the OS is laid out to make this safe, but also how we apply those patches. Um, so for instance, the way our model works is very, it's inspired by the browsers where these different, there are these different channels for updates. So if you're a bleeding edge developer that wants the latest and greatest stuff, you can be on the alpha channel. And you're going to get the like, patches as soon as they're ready. If you want the latest version of Docker a day after you get it, be on the alpha channel. Yeah. Customers on the beta channel are, are you know, more feature complete but still testing. And then the stable channel guys are the ones that like, they just want the updates when they're ready, but they don't want to futz around with security. Okay? And w when we pass our updates through these different channels, they're bit for bit identical. So the thing we give the alpha guys is exactly what the stable guys will get eventually. It's just alpha guys get a bunch more of them because we find bugs and stuff in alpha. Yeah. And so like, 
that's just an example of how we can make these make the process safe too. What and percentage things. of your users choose which channel? So, you know, well, we had the alpha out the longest. We shipped our first alpha last August, and then we shipped a beta maybe three months ago now. And the the version that's on beta right now is our our second RC for stable. It might get promoted. It'll be kind of this like non-event because the release is already out there, right? It's just we're finally calling it stable. Yeah. Uh, but it's exciting for us because our users are like, here's a production ready version. Do these updates reboot the server or do, do anything to uh, uh, take down, down you know, cause downtime or anything like that? Yes. They do. So, so that's what one reason you might not want <laughs> your exactly. servers updating every But again, uh, this comes hour. back, so, so high availability plays sort of hand in hand with patching and updating. If, like we talked about, if we go to these ops teams and we're like, hey, can we pull a plug on one of your servers and things keep working, do you want that? They'll be like, yes. And so we also start building in all the clustering tools for you yeah. as well so that you can actually have that type of environment. So you can you know, ha do it with no compromises. You can, you can kill a server at any time and things keep working. And our view is like, you should put a monitor on your server. How long has it been running? Has it been running for over two weeks? Well, let's fire an alert. Let's reboot that server because it's going to have a it's going to create these single points of failure and, and these, these areas of, of fragility in your environment if you don't like just face it you know, and deal with it. And so, yes, we do have kind of a wild stance uh, given current sort of mentality on how you, how you run servers, but it's the, like, it's, it's the right stance. Um, it's just yeah. it's previously been too difficult for people to actually adopt that. And so essentially, I mean, to summarize all this, I guess it's just we take these best, best practices and we make them accessible to people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and there's no denying that they're the best practices. What people have issues with is just the difficulty of adopting them. No, that's true. What was the third thing? A very interesting piece of technology that we have in there is CoreOS is clustered by default. So that means you can just boot more, more servers and they come up uh, and able to communicate. So let's say you boot five servers. You can shoot one of those servers at any time, and your application will automatically move around if it happened to be running on that one machine. And similarly, you can boot that sixth server, and now your applications just have more capacity to run. And this is how like, people want to run their infrastructure. It's just been too difficult to actually pull that off. And we just bake it in as primitives into CoreOS itself. Can you distribute that cluster over different data centers? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty neat. When you start running your servers this way, you start looking at your infrastructure as just resources. So if let's say you're running across data centers, well now it's like, oh, I have a really slow networking connection between them. And that's what the application has to observe, right? Or, or I have, over here I have fast disks, but when I talk to this other app, it's very slow because over the network and it's really far away because you might be routing across the internet. But yeah, you can definitely start running multi-data centers. So for instance, which company wouldn't want to be able to do a, a multi-data center failover, right? Yeah. So like Amazon goes down and now they're up on Rackspace. Something like the geeks have dreamed about for a long time. All the primitives are there in CoreOS to do it, so give wow. it a shot. So now you got to get Rackspace and Amazon to get CoreOS uh, deployed. Yeah, exactly. Well, actually, Rackspace uh, was the first cloud provider to put CoreOS as a top-level OS that you can go and boot. So in the cloud, there's like eight images that you can go and launch. CoreOS is one of them. Quickly thereafter, Google followed. They did it as well. And Amazon, we're in the marketplace and that sorts of stuff, but everybody's at Amazon, so it's less exciting. Very cool. Yeah. Tell me about your team and what are they focused on? What are you having them do? Sure. So our team is built pretty much exactly for this. <laughs> um, you know, Brandon, our CTO and co-founder, was previously at Novell on uh, working on SUSE. He was on the SEAL Team 6 of kernel development teams uh, at SUSE, the like hardcore, the hardcore guys. Um, Mike joins us from Google, where he was a SRE, running production server infrastructure at Google. Walden was working on OpenStack. He was a technical lead on one of the OpenStack components. Blake was the first employee at Heroku who wrote Sinatra, the web framework, and is you know, seen as an expert in distributed systems and many things web infrastructure. Jonathan was at Twitter helping run the clusters there. I mean, it kind of goes on and on. Our most junior guys are, are two master's students out of Carnegie Mellon in distributed systems. So everybody is very, very strong and capable, and we're building the like, ideal set of tools based on all this knowledge um, from working at these giant companies. Is this going to be uh, uh, more secure? Definitely, I, and, definitely. And is it just just because you're patching better? Just because or? you're patching. That's what we think, like, the secret. Or is there something else? Because I, I was just in Israel and talking with uh, Theta, Theta Ray, it's a new security company, and they're looking for anomalies, which is uh, uh, a new way of doing security right. to see if anybody's breaking in or is trying to break in. Yeah. Right. I mean, there are many different ways to protect security, like, 
you know, it depends on, on, on what your attack vector is, what you're protecting against, right? Um, but at the end of the day, if you just run the latest software, you're going to be the most secure that you can be. And, and so we, again, nobody will argue you with that. Like, if you ask somebody, like, well, yeah. applying a patch help me with security, it's like, yes. But the problem is, is it's too fragile to do that reliably and automatically right now. And that's why we built all this tech around making it safe. So, I mean, when I started this whole project, the, the whole basis of this was, what could I do to fundamentally like, improve the security of the internet? What could I do to secure the internet? Something that me and my friends, we could get together and actually take a swing at it. And, and the root idea in all of this was if we could just automatically update a server, as simple as it sounds, like we think we can make huge strides towards that goal. Yeah, it's amazing that we're, we're not yet there. I know, it's like 2014, wow, <laughs> you know. And you see this even at Facebook, even running uh, stuff on top, my wife doesn't have the latest Facebook features, I do. So mm -hmm. you can tell even at Facebook they have 100,000 servers and they're not all on the same software. Right. right? Right. Uh, now they're doing it partly because of business. Maybe they try something new and the users don't like it, so they're going to retard the uh, propagation of that to more users because if they're pissing off this group of users, they can tell through the, the data that's coming off. Tell me about logging. Are, are you uh, a able to see new things in, in the servers on CoreOS that you couldn't see on uh, other, other versions of Linux? Sure. So, I mean, logging, we have no specific like products built in for, for logging. Um, other than the logging system that's in CoreOS is very modern. For instance, you can like export your logs as JSON. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, welcome to 2014. We can now export our logs into JSON instead of having to write a, a Perl script um, to parse things and do all that. And so we don't have a specific like logging product that we have built into CoreOS. You can plumb it into your existing logging uh, tools that you would have, but we do sort of have modern capabilities as, as part of the base platform, like uh, export to JSON. You have it running on your screen here, right? Yeah, I, I have a little product page up here for uh, this core update. Um, core update is one of the commercial add-ons to CoreOS. So this is meant for companies that um, that want to push the buttons on when the updates go out. So yes, I think we have a very altruistic idea that like we should be able to update everybody automatically at any given time, but there's also a practical side effect where companies want control of that, and so we give them the control. Um, Core update, this dashboard is showing, you know, here's a set of servers and graphs about the different versions that they're on. Um, and it allows you to, to express, like, it allows you to say these things like, hey, turn updates off for a minute. We're going through our big release. We don't want anything to happen, no matter what. Even though it's, like, built to be robust, we just don't even want to risk it. Or it allows you to say things like, um, you know, update 5% of the cluster at a time and, and monitor the feedback coming off the system to make sure that there are no errors. But that's all the operator has to do. They push a button. They don't have to, you know, log into machines or run scripts or anything. It's all, yeah. all fully integrated. So no loading a whole bunch of Chef or Puppet or... No, it's just all like baked that. in, yeah. Very cool. Um, get, get, get nerdy with me. Mm -hmm. Underneath, when you, if you're talking to an engineer and want to show off what, what really you've done underneath, what, what would you brag about? Sure. I mean, if you want to get real geeky, we can start talking about partition tables. Um, one of the things... Way that, over my head. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that we do that's like, again, we're like, welcome to the new world, um, is, you know, like on your phone, how you can press a factory reset button? Yeah. And you didn't blow away the whole OS. You right. just like took away all the configuration and then you're back to like a known state. That's how we built CoreOS. You'd be surprised, like, why don't servers work that way, right? It's just kind of like a head scratcher. But we just built this into the OS. So the, the geeky way of doing a factory reset is you go rm minus rf slash. This is this, like, fabled command between sysadmins that everybody runs once accidentally in their lives. And what it does is it destroys the whole system. It deletes everything, OK? On CoreOS, if you run rm minus rf slash, you'll you'll get a factory reset. Your server just goes back to a known state. And you're like, you reboot it, and it comes up fresh like it was the first time you ever booted it. You know, and it's just like the way we we're able to all do the data's gone, all the settings are gone, that you, or all the customization you did. Is well, the way it works is there's one, just like a phone. there's one special directory on the file system that has the core, the core OS in it, and that part is protected from the rest. And so you can still change it and add your own data and everything, but like that one piece is sort of fixed and read only so that nobody, you can't change it, <laughs> you know, like yeah. you, you can, you boot to it and it's going to always do the same thing over and over again. And you have like cryptographic guarantees that what you're booting is the thing that you think it should be. Yeah. And it's, I mean, that's better for security. It's also better for, for consistency so that you know exactly what's running on a server and so on. Very cool.
Keep keep getting dirty. I, I think this. Keep cool. getting dirty. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. The next the next next piece of tech we built was this thing called etcd. Etcd. So the idea behind etcd is when you have more than one server, you innately need to start sharing configuration. Yeah. Your app server needs to know where the database is and, and so on. And if you again talk to a bunch of architects and say, what is the best possible way to share configuration data? What you end up is with this type of key value store that's distributed uh, by nature. So yeah. you start talking about things like quorums and fault tolerance and consensus algorithms. Okay? There's a, a product that's been around for a while as part of the Hadoop suite called Zookeeper, which sort of fulfills this, this primitive. Um, Zookeeper, while a great piece of technology, is, um, is mainly for the Java community. It can be used outside of the Java community, but it's just not, it doesn't really fit well, okay? Yeah. So we built the equivalent of Zookeeper called etcd, and every server has a slash etc, which is where configuration is, hold, is held, um, and etcd is the distributed version of slash etc. Uh, that's why it's etcd, and, and um, we bake this into the OS. And what the net result of this is, is you can boot more and more machines, and they just have a centralized place to share configuration. And that data store that's doing it is all self-contained within CoreOS, as well as it's all fault tolerant. So the data is automatically being replicated between the machines in such a way that you could shoot arbitrary hosts and you won't lose that data. Wow. So etcd, it's built into the OS, but it's an yeah. own open source project and it's being adopted all over the place. The Pivotal guys have baked it into their Cloud Foundry project. Um, the, there was Google just released a cluster manager built on top of etcd. It's like its own whole thing that's taking off. And it just speaks to the, like, one, the talent of the team that they can just, as a side project, pull off something like that. Yeah. But two, the need for, like, people want to do this kind of stuff. It's just too hard to do it. Yeah. Do you have uh, customers using CoreOS? And what, what have they started reporting to you as, the, as, as what it changed about their business? Sure. Um, so we're just getting out the gate on our commercial products. We have been piloting, you know, with folks as an early stage startup guy. I'm like, can we get folks to pilot, you know, as we're, we're in the product development process? And we've definitely been able to do that. And, you know, I think from one customer, I can't say who they are. They explicitly requested not to say who they are. But one customer is like, look, before CoreOS, we were dinosaurs. And now we feel like we just skipped the last 15 years of software evolution. And we can just go straight to what's next. Um, and so it's exciting to, you know, enable people in that way. Where do we learn more about it? CoreOS.com. Very right, cool. And uh, tell me a little bit about uh, how you got funded. Uh, yeah, so we just announced our Series A. Uh, it was led by Kleiner Perkins uh, with Sequoia Capital participating uh, as well. Sequoia invests in Rackspace. So. Perfect. Yeah, it's all in the family. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in. And all right. Tell me about your company. Thank you. Yeah.